Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited. Every team, every topic, everywhere, this is Believe. Ich warte seit Wochen auf diesen Tag und tanz vor Freude über den Asphalt. Als wär's sein Rhythmus, als gäb's sein Lied. Was mich immer weiter durch die Straßen zieht, komm dir entgegen. Hallo und willkommen zu Gegenpressen, der Bundesliga Podcast. Das ist der Main Show. I'm Manu Feit. Hier ist Stefan Bienkowski. Und Stefan, before we start, we have some homework to do. Some shoutouts. How's it going, first of all? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm doing very, very well, thank you. Uh, a new week, so can't complain. And our great weekend of football. Uh, mm. And yes, we do. So we put out a shout-out on the feeds, asking people to leave some reviews, because it was beginning to irk me that the last response we'd had, at least in the UK, I don't know if it's pan-European, but certainly in the UK, the last review we had was from a Pete D from five years ago um, <laughs> was saying that the podcast's pretty good at covering Russian football, which obviously refers back to what the show's previous incarnation was, blah, blah, blah. So we asked some people to leave some reviews. I was delighted to say we've got at least two so far. Uh, Jason C says, great way to catch up in German football. Sadly, doesn't cover the Russian game. But alas, we can't have it all. I'm afraid we can't, Jason. Uh, quite right. A lovely kind of review and kind of you know, just a reflection on uh, the modern world. Uh, and then to even to cheer me up even more, uh, we had Todd Whedon who said, being a Dortmund fan in the UK, it's not always easy to find in-depth analysis of the Bundesliga games. With this pod, Manu and Stefan and guests always strike the, the right balance with opinions, insight and reviews, not only with the prediction show, but also with a great roundup of the weekend's games on a Monday, uh, plus weekly bonus uh, shows that I subscribe to. I couldn't recommend this pod enough for fans of the Bundesliga. So thank you very much to Jason and Todd for the reviews. And like I said last week, um, anyone who'd like to leave a review, not only do we really appreciate it, but we'll also give you a shout out on the show. So mm. it's a good opportunity if you want to kind of get your feedback, criticisms, all around um, rants to the front of the queue. Uh, yeah, leave a review. And of course, if you don't subscribe to the show or on the, in the newsletter, uh, it's worth saying that when people do respond to the show on that, we do respond to them directly as well there. So mm. yeah, just a bit of uh, housekeeping before we jump into the show. Yeah, I find it find it odd that um, Apple only shows you the reviews that you're getting in the country that you live in. Because I have to add that we did actually get one on December 14th from Richard of Saskatchewan, Stefan. Um, in Canada, so I guess I only get to see the Apple Canadian ones on Apple. <laughs> and he described us as great personalities, <laughs> funny and also very knowledgeable. Look forward to listening each week. This Canadian Bundesliga fan really appreciates the work that goes into the episodes. So if you're in Canada, leave reviews, you get a shout out too. <laughs> but um, Stefan, we have a lot to talk about this week, um, so we should jump into it right after this break. This episode of the Gegenpressing Podcast is brought to you by Bet Online. Bet Online remains your number one source for all your sports betting this season. Everything from pro and college basketball to UFC, MMA, and more. You always find the latest odds, team matchup info, player news, and game trends at Bet Online. With live betting options, free contests, and live scores for almost any sport or game imaginable. Bet online is truly the fastest and easiest way to bet all your favorite leagues and events. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to join and receive your 50% welcome bonus with your first deposit. Make sure to use the promo code BELIEF, B L E A V, BELIEF, to receive your rewards. BetOnline.ag 
where the game starts. Ja, so. Should we start with the Riviera Derby? Is that the one that we should put all our attention on? Um, well, before we considering... go into... <laughs> yeah, considering most of the Bundesliga did its best to just draw every single game, uh, I mm. guess including this one, uh, we should at least start with one that had at least a bit of drama behind it. Yeah, well, the Riviera Derby, okay. <laughs> Here we go then. So, Dortmund... This was a week of truth. Um, and it's pretty safe to say they bottled it, Stefan. And that's not sugarcoating it, I think, at all. <laughs> you know, they had a game in the Champions League that I still think in in retrospect they should have won. We reviewed that in great length, right? So if you if you're interested in our on our takes on Dortmund's Champions League game, um go go hit up the Champions League um, review show. Um, and then this derby against Schalke. And we were talking about this game, as we always do when we when we have the main big matches right in our WhatsApp chat. And um, I think that, as Chris Williams put it, Dortmund, Dortmund it. <laughs> I think that was a really good way of putting it. You cannot... I know it's a Revier Derby. It has, has its own rules. It has its its own history. Um, the history that you know, a history even of where Dortmund has bottled a title race in the past, right? As I as I put in my newsletter last week, and I'm not going to say they bottled the title race here. I think it's it's far too early, and they do have a big match coming up in two match weeks, um, right? Um, right after the international break, where they can set this right. Um, but it does feel like a massive opportunity lost, especially after going up twice against Schalke. And of course, a shout out, huge shout out to Schalke, who did come back. And I think, you know, we were kind of talking about it. I was saying in the chat, Dortmund deserved this, the straw. But Schalke do too. This is a really well won point by them in the relegation battle. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it was an it was an interesting game. Um you know, obviously, Dortmund were cont- having to really wrestle with a number of injuries um, mm. to that squad, and I think Terzic quite admirably tried to kind of shuffle the pack. Uh, he was trying to be a little, um, you know, creative in terms of how he fixed problems. Uh, some of them worked, some of them didn't work. Um, I thought. For example, Guillermo as a number eight actually worked really, really well. I was really impressed with mm-hmm. him. Uh, obviously, he scored a tremendous goal, but I just thought in general he was just a really handy player there. And, and he's obviously got that in his kind of locker, if you'll, if you'll allow the expression, in the sense that you know he's obviously yeah. got a lot of pace, got a lot of energy. Technically, he's a very good player in terms of his passing and obviously you know his technique to score that goal. If you actually kind of watch the replay, uh, which obviously I did at the time, it, it's one of those goals that looks even more impressive because he doesn't he doesn't really kind of just throw his foot at the shot. He doesn't hit it with power. He actually, near enough, just kind of clips it with his toe to just kind of almost nestle it into the far corner, which just goes to show, mm. you know, how technically gifted he is as a player. So I thought playing him as a midfielder actually worked really well for Dortmund to a large extent. But... Um, there were issues kind of elsewhere throughout the team. And I think, I mean, my newsletter this week is actually on the fact that Gio Reyna started on the bench in this game. And yeah. although I don't really think Reyna has any God-given right to start games for Dortmund this season, uh, you know, because of his form and things, I think it was quite telling that Terzic opted for, you know, Donio Malin and Bayern Gittens over him. Um, you know, Obviously, anyone who's been listening to this show this season will know that Malin's kind of struggled for much of the campaign. Um, mm. Where someone like Adeyemi had a tricky first half of the season, but kind of managed to kind of turn it around uh, in the winter break and really hit the ground running. I felt like Malin has still kind of struggled. Um, there was a moment, actually, when he came up against Mitri Asini, the, the Schalke defender. He basically tried to outrun him. And that didn't work out, and the Schalke defender quite comfortably managed to keep up with him and take the ball off him in the opening moments of this game. And it just kind of looked to me as though he looked... I mean, he looked 
almost all out of ideas. And he did have a decent chance in the first half, which I think obviously Farman does well to kind of stop stop it going into the back of the net. And you can definitely give credit to the Schalke keeper, in, in which case you could say, you know, at least Malin made him force the save. But I did kind of look at that kind of chance and think if that was an Adeyemi or a Marco Royce or perhaps even a Julian Brandt in that position, it probably would have been a goal. And it was really the only thing we kind of saw from Malin. I mean, he did kind of make the decent runs. He kind of held a decent line alongside Haller. So he was making the movements, I guess, which you would expect of him to make. Mm. But as we've seen him from time and time again, he just kind of seems to lack the kind of ability to do something with the ball once he has it, uh, whether that be to score a goal or to create chances for other players. And it felt to me like that entire front three for Dortmund was really faltering one way or another. Um, I felt Bayern Gittins really struggled in this game. And it was actually the second game in a row that I think he's looked really quite off it, to be honest with you. Obviously, in the yeah. Chelsea game, he came on. And I think at one point, he actually just ran the ball straight out of the pitch. <laughs> so, you know, he, he looked a little starstruck there, maybe at Stamford Bridge. In this game, I thought he really struggled as well. Obviously, in the second half, he had that big chance where one on one, where he knocks it wide. Again, another opportunity where maybe if Adeyemi or Royce or Branson there, that's a goal. Um, and I think what maybe is getting overlooked here as well, which is partly down to the fact that people obviously have a lot of good grace for him because of what he's gone through. Uh, and, you know, the fact that he's even on the pitch is just a remarkable. Um, yeah. Um, it's just a remarkable um, shows a remarkable ability from his physical attributes to do that but I do feel like Haller's was, he looked extremely jaded in this game and if you actually kind of look at his average positioning off and on the ball uh, he's far, far, far too deep. So he's maybe mm. playing as that kind of target man where he's allowing players to play off him but he obviously just didn't have the kind of fitness or the stamina to obviously push forward once he was off the ball to kind of offer chances so it looked like a Dortmund team to me who was kind of a little worse for wear um, and the kind of backup players who had came in aside from Gero really struggled there but on the flip side you obviously had a Schalke team as well who I thought did relatively well you know I mean aside from mm. the Schlotterbeck kind of wonder goal uh, who people on Twitter were gleefully delighted to point out to me he scored quite literally a moment after I tweeted out that he was having a pretty poor game. In fact, <laughs> considering the way that I watch the games in the UK here is through a TV app rather than live TV. So I think the app that I watch the games on is maybe a minute, minute and a half behind real time. So yeah. I think there's probably a good chance that he had actually already scored the goal before my tweet actually went live. So that just goes to show <laughs> the misfortune I had of that time and of that tweet. But... Aside from that sh that goal in the first half, I thought Schalke had done pretty well to keep close to Dortmund. And I think the most impressive thing over the course of the game was just the fact that they just kept coming back and coming back and coming back, and they just weren't they just weren't willing to really give up. And yeah, it was a huge testament to Schalke. And as you said, they deserved a point yeah. not just because Dortmund were disappointing, but I also thought their tenacity was just really impressive. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, I think that the fact that they, I mean, first of all, the atmosphere at um, of Schalke was incredible. Um, it was loud. It was aggressive. Um, you know, I made a big point of this being, of course, the first Revier Derby that Schalke has hosted in front of fans in like almost four years, right? Mm. Um, which is, and you could tell that it was a special moment for them. And you know what? I think... I'm going to make a really big statement here that I'm probably going to regret later on. But I think this is the moment when Schalke started going on a path of securing their stay in the Bundesliga. Because if you play like this, um, with this kind of tenacity, week in, week out, you're going to get a lot of points. Um, and this one point is, is, is tremendous for them in the relegation battle, right? Um, it kind of shows that I think... Also, in retrospect, the fact that they signed Thomas Reis, someone who did the same thing with Bochum, right? Um, mm. Kind of able to get them out of the relegation battle in a really difficult situation. And he seems to be repeating this trick now um, with Schalke. That's a testament of being a good coach and understanding the, the, the situation that you're in and also just not 
not willing to give up. Um, and when you actually look at the the stats of this game too, yeah, of course, like Dortmund had the majority of possession, right? Mm. Um, but when you actually look at some of the things, like distance run, for example, it was 114.3 to 114.6 kilometers run, right? Mm. The um, XG was actually 1.66 to 1.96, so slightly in Dortmund's favor, but not by a lot. This is not an undeserved draw. Mm. Uh, by any means of the imagination so you know Schalke had to work really hard for this but I think they really deserved it in, in every in every matter and also like I think just for Dortmund if you want to win the title and you go up a second time you just need to shut this game down Stefan mm. that's that's another takeaway I have from this as good as Schalke have been and as hard as they work but it, it it's still a team that is fighting against relegation and yes it's difficult of Schalke I get all of that but you got to shut this game down um and yes maybe this is you're in a completely different situation when if Adeyemi is fit if Brandt is fit if Kobel is fit right mm. the situation will be maybe a bit different Marco Reus of course also not uh, available for this game but you still if you go up a second time and you want to win the title you just gotta shut down this game after the mm. second goal. Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited. Yeah, I think, yeah, I completely agree with you. And the only other, another stat that I would add, add to that kind of catalogue of ones you used to highlight how well Schalke played is that although XG numbers obviously vary in this game depending on which outlet you go to, but the one I used actually had Schalke finishing the game with a higher XG than Dortmund. So, and you know, as much as we talk about the chances that Bayern Gittins or Malin missed, Salazar also missed a one-on-one -on -one in the first half, you know, before Dortmund actually scored their opening goal. So it's not as if Schalke kind of, it was a kind of punch and run or smash and grab rather um, is the expression, yeah. I think. Um, and I think, you know, you're absolutely right in terms of the kind of the way that Dortmund struggled to finish off this game. And I think the, th the things that kind of stand stood out to me at the time were that, um, I mean, I think the really obvious one here, and I think Sebastian Kell maybe talked about it after the game, was the fact that Jude Bellingham did not look 100% in this game. Uh, no. He wore a knee brace for over the course of the match and... You know, he, he he obviously had moments of kind of magic like he always does, but he also kind of looked very sloppy as well. And I actually think, if I'm not mistaken, the second Schalke goal came about from either him losing the ball. And yeah, then, it was him. And then, yeah, yeah, he loses the ball. But I think just before he loses the ball, Emery Chan loses the ball in a very similar situation. And mm. the two of them, as the game went on, began to kind of get quite jaded and, you know, we've talked about this as well on the show that I think Emery Chan's had a very good kind of rebound at Dortmund this season but yeah. he's done so as a third central defender it's you know not, not technically he obviously starts in midfield and if you look at any lineup graphic he's, he's a midfielder but in and out of possession this season he has kind of slotted in as a third central defender alongside Schlotterbeck and um, Sula but because Dortmund were so short and in, 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 in quite literally manpower and he had to kind of fill back into that former central midfield role which is where i think he has struggled over the last two or three seasons for dortmund and i think yeah. again we kind of saw that this in this game where bizarrely if you'd play him only 15 or 20 feet further up the pitch he just kind of suddenly turns into a completely different player for dortmund um and i think there are other issues as well i thought hummels and schlotterbeck um were very clumsy at the back they didn't seem to have a really great kind of chemistry between them. I also kind of felt like with Hummels back in that defence, it kind of pulled the gravitational pull away from Schlotterbeck towards Hummels because Hummels obviously great pass of the ball, often demands it. He's obviously the guy who kind of tries to lead out the back. Um, and what had kind of happened for much this season where you had Nicholas Sula and Schlotterbeck as a defensive pair, Sula was more than happy to just give the ball to Schlotterbeck and Schlotterbeck starts passes. But all of a sudden you have Hummels in there for Sula uh, and he's kind of been relegated to kind of a, a, the supporting role again. So I felt at times that didn't really work quite well. It's quite interesting that Sula was kind of 
surprisingly dropped for this game. But yeah, to get again to kind of flip it back onto Schalke, um, I was actually at a press conference ahead of this game, a Schalke press conference with um, Sebastian Poulter and Michael Langer. And, and Poulter was actually, um, if I'm not mistaken, was actually with Thomas Rice at Bochum last year. And I mm-hmm. actually asked him about, you know, about Thomas Rice and what had happened in that winter break, kind of mid-season training camp that has meant Schalke have come back um, as this new team. And he said, well, you know, it, it was because we basically had the time to basically rebuild the team, you know, and, and reacquaint mm. ourselves with this new head coach. And I thought it was really interesting because I, I, it made me recall at the start of the season when we were doing our preview shows and some su- subscribers were saying to us, you know, do you think this season is going to be different because we have this huge break in the middle of the season because yeah. of the World Cup? And Porter was basically saying, you know, because we had this huge break, Thomas Rice was basically able to set us down make sure we're on the same page, we're all reading from the same tactics book, which you simply wouldn't have had in a normal winter break. And I thought it was interesting, another thing he said was that even though they all now play this kind of very defensive uh, system, it the, the whole system basically hinges or hangs on the idea that every player has to win their one-on-one duels. So it's not really a defensive system in the sense that, you know, you, you just throw numbers at the problem and you park the bus and you hope that two or three defenders throw themselves in front of an opponent whenever they hit a shot. It's it's a defensive system that applies a huge amount of personal responsibility on every player to ensure that they don't let their man pass them. And I think that's obviously worked very well for Schalke because it's meant that, you know, obviously, as I wrote in a newsletter a few weeks ago, they've managed to basically really grind out results because they've been able to rely on mm. that defensive stability. But I think a system like that, that means every single person is pulling their own weight, obviously naturally just kind of builds a, a natural kind of team ethos that everyone can get behind. And you can tell mm. that everyone at Schalke is now, you know, singing from the same hymn sheet. They all believe in what Thomas Rice has implemented there. And, you know, the scenes at full time, you would have thought they just won the German Cup or something. The way that they and <laughs> and it's and it's just further kind of proof that, that things are working for them. And you know, I, I thought it was really interesting that basically just about every team in the bottom half of the table except Hoffenheim picked up yeah. points this weekend. And you know, Schalke could easily kind of walk away from that game and say, yeah, we got a point in a game that we shouldn't have won. But since Stuttgart and Hertha picked up a point and Bochum won, that actually doesn't mean anything. But of course they won't because they'll just look at that performance and say, this is further proof that what we're doing is working, you know? Yeah. And it'll give them a huge amount of confidence going into their next game, uh, which is against Augsburg, which is a perfectly winnable match. It is a very perfectly winnable match. And it, this is a great transition because... <laughs> I think, as as you said, um, everyone but Hoffenheim picked up points down there, right? Um, Hoffenheim's sinking like a stone. It's not looking good for them at all. Um, Augsburg, in the meantime, they faced Bayern Munich in it was at times a hilarious match, Stefan. <laughs> I know you didn't you didn't watch this uh, particular game. Um, Augsburg took the lead. You know, uh, Bayern Munich, of course, with the traditional wobble. Um, they quickly, Bayern and quickly turned this around. Joao Cancelo and Pavard scoring. Uh, Cancelo for a single goal, Pavard with a brace. And, um, and you know, I thought this was quite, you know, a really good sign for Bayern Munich because these were two players that have been negatively in the news this season, right? Uh, Joao Cancelo, of course, comes over from Man City. Um praised by the media, including ourselves, as being a, a big transfer for Bayern, but then has struggled to kind of make an impact there right away. And was actually dropped for some time, right? Julian Nagelsmann um, comparing um, Cancelo's situation to that of Angelino, who he had with Leipzig, right? And um, mm. sort of then turned around, turned him around. Um, Cancelo starts this match and then equalizes and then Pavard scores twice. Um, that's why I said earlier, last week well i said last week that i wouldn't really call the cancelo them not triggering the the the, the buy option as a news of them by Munich not getting him right um i think this is part of the negotiations um early on as for pavard um he's looking like he could actually be staying now 
Um, he's slowly but surely becoming more and more important player for Bayern, for Bayern under Nagelsmann. And then after those three goals by Cancelo and Pavard, Bayern just go and make it 4-1 really quickly. And you think it's over, but it's not because Berisha then makes it 4-2. And it's not really until Davies makes it uh, a 5-2 in the 74th minute that you can actually say, okay, this is game is over. Um, because he, Bayern Munich so many times this year, and including this fixture, you just get the sense that even a big lead isn't quite enough. And even when Bayern made it 5-2, Cardona then scored another one in the 93rd minute to make it 5-3. Um, some stats on this, and I, I think it's quite telling. That, and here again, the XG, and I, I, as you mentioned this earlier, the XG that I use is from the official Bundesliga site, right? The mm. Bundesliga.com app. Um, which is powered by AWS, which provides all the statistics for them, just so people know what I'm sourcing. Um, and the, the XG for this game was 2.8 versus 2.59, right? So I think when you go based on that, if this had been a draw, I don't think Bayern Munich fans could have complained. And it's just, I think this kind of game, it was kind of like a blueprint of what Bayern Munich season has been. They are spectacular, defensively wobbly, defensively strong, and sometimes defensively uh, 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 an attack wasteful all at once. They're kind of like all over the place so many mm. times. And this is why I'm still convinced that we're going to have at least another spell where Bayern Munich are going to draw points because you just did. <sighs> I'm just trying to find, find the right word for this. They're so unpredictable this year. Mm. And sometimes you get that unpredictability within a 90-minute frame. And this was exactly what happened here. They are obviously so gifted in the attack, right? They have some of the best defensive players in the world. But yet, they have this ability to make some really obvious mistakes, um, especially during the Bundesliga this year. And I find it so very odd that when they get challenged in the Champions League, they are able to switch all of that off. It's almost like there's two Bayern Munich teams. There's the one that plays in the Champions League that's just extremely consistent, wins every game, even against the biggest sides in the world. And then there's the one against Augsburg where they're like, ah, yeah, well, this is just our day-to-day -day business, whatever. <laughs> and, and it results in really weird results. Um, it's just something that I observed in this game. Like, I mean, it did win 5-3, so it's really hard to criticize them for it. And it was it's spectacular. And I think everyone in the Allianz Arena will be going home happy because they just saw eight goals in 90 minutes, right? Mm. But you just wonder, like, is this sustainable? Yeah, you know, so I didn't actually get a chance to watch this game. Um, my only contribution to it was to tweet out at 1-0 to Augsburg that, you know this maybe sums up Bayern's season and every time I don't watch them and think ahead of time this is going to be a game that Bayern will win comfortably they end up dropping points and as was the kind of theme of the weekend every time I tweeted something the opposite happened uh, and within a space of about I think it was maybe two or three minutes um, you know Bayern had obviously turned the result around and they were 2-1 up but yeah, I mean, really interested in, in your kind of in, in your kind of um, analysis of this game because I, it it makes me think of um, I was chatting to a colleague about the situation Liverpool had at the weekend where they came off mm. a very impressive derby win against Manchester United to then draw against Bournemouth in the Premier League and no, they lost that game. Sorry, apologies. Yes, um, <laughs> and you know they were kind of puzzled by it and. Yeah. I feel like there's something that's often overlooked in football is that, you know, and I'm sure you could probably dig up a hundred quotes from managers who say the same thing that they'll say, you know, half the time, nine, like most of the effort you have to put in as a head coach is just to simply inspire these players to get going. It's not about teaching them how to cross the ball or how to shoot or how to pass or how to follow your tactics. It's just about convincing them somehow or inspiring them to actually perform well and mm. like Liverpool I think it's probably very easy for Nagelsmann to get his team 
excited about a Champions League game. You know, they go into those PSG matches knowing that every single player knows I have to be my absolute best here yeah. to make sure we go through. And really, Nagelsmann probably has very little to do in the changing room in that game. Where he probably earns his money is at home against Augsburg, where complacency is just desperate to seep into that performance. And, mm. you know, I mean, is that kind of the impression you had from this game in the sense that, because obviously having not watched it and seen a result like that, it felt to me like, well, you know, it's still quite comprehensive for Bayern, even if we were a little sloppy in defence. But it's it's interesting that you kind of look at, you, you stepped away from that game thinking Bayern still have a lot of problems to deal with. Yeah, I think this this game could have also ended three three or four four. <laughs> I mean, you gotta give it to Bayern that whenever Augsburg did threaten to come a little bit closer, they they were able to find another gear and um, score another goal. And we we have seen in the past, and then especially in the Bundesliga, that they haven't been able to do that. Right, that when when they were kind of threatened to drop points, they weren't able to find that extra gear. Um, for example, when. Davies scores right after the penalty, the Berisha penalty, um, to sort of really put this game to bed. Because there it was a there was a good five, six minutes with if Augsburg score again and make it four three, then I think we're talking about a very different result here. Um mm-hmm. so I think what you can take away from this game is that and this is the positives, right? We want to also underline the positives. We've been accused of being too negatives at times. So I want to underline the positive here that they were able to find that extra gear and say, okay, well, they're coming back, they're creeping back again. We have we have to step one up here and really put this game to bed and then they'll quickly do so. It's just, yeah, I find it, I find this, um, I find these results fascinating because um, as you said, like they are, they are so very good in the Champions League. And yes, they, because I guess they, they just, they just understand the situation that they're in so much better, but this year in the Bundesliga, this is they're in a situation in the Bundesliga this year. And yes, Dortmund dropped points and they, they will be happy about that, right? Um, but I still think that they're in a situation where they still have to win pretty much every game in order to ensure to win the title at the end of the year, right? Mm. Um, and this is a situation that is, I think, a little bit new to them. And I think what's also new to them is that other teams now go to the Allianz Arena and say, hey, not only can we score here, we can maybe also take a point or, two, or three. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a little bit different from, from years past. Like Augsburg can be maybe criticized a little bit that when they did go up 1-0, that they kind of threw the game away. You know, mm-hmm. they conceded four goals in quick succession. And if they had been a bit more tidy and a bit better organized, then they probably, probably get a result here a result that's very important for them because they are um slowly but surely dropping into that relegation battle right Mm. um but i think still like that's another takeaway for me is that every you can now go and look at every Bayern munich home game and say oh the other team will go there and say oh maybe we can sneak a point Mm. right and yeah, a point is just a point, but that's two points dropped in, in, the, in the Bundesliga title race. And I think this year, that could be decisive. So um, obviously Bayern the next in Leverkusen, which will be a bit different. I think this is going to be a game that they're going to win just based on on historical uh, results. But the game after that, after the international break, is against Borussia Dortmund at home. Mm. And Dortmund will have will look at these results and say... This is not the Allianz Arena of all. We could maybe go there and get get a result, right? Mm. Um, and I find that is a bit different than it was in years past. Yeah, I mean, I think it'd be very easy to kind of look at the results from this weekend and say, ah, right, this is when the title race comes to an end. This is when Bayern start to pull away. And, mm. you know, we all have to kind of pack things up for another year and, you know, <laughs> just kind of clap for Bayern as they kind of come through the final straight and once again you know blah 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 I think um, it's too pretty much sure for that 
Yeah, we're I not, mean, we're well, not this is yet. the thing, isn't it? These these next two games that Bayern have will be really interesting to see how they do react to that because, in a way, you could almost, despite losing the game, you could probably say Augsburg maybe would walk away from that match probably with more confidence because you know someone like Barisha who scored two goals at Allianz Arena will be on cloud nine in the sense that they've mm. kind of you know, he scored two goals against Bayern Munich. I can definitely do that against Schalke next weekend. So. Um, but yeah, I do kind of feel like a lot is already kind of leading up to this Dortmund game. Um, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. it'd be very typical of Dortmund to maybe lose the game or drop points before that and make this game suddenly worth nothing. Um, but it's it's now kind of, we're almost, we're not quite in the home straight, but if Bayern can kind of pick up three points against Leverkusen and then beat Dortmund, you would kind of probably have to say, well, that's a quite conclusive defence of their title. Um, yeah because there's probably not going to be a challenge from elsewhere, especially based on how Union Berlin did against Wolfsburg on Sunday. Although, um, I mean, this is a good transition. You have to point out that Leipzig won again. And they they probably still in it too. Um, They won't admit it, but, you know, they're probably still in it too. And they won their game quite conclusively, 3-0. But yes, Union Berlin... um, they are now in a situation where they have to watch that they not drop out of the top four, Stefan, I think, after that 1-1 draw against Wolfsburg. You watched this game. What were your thoughts on this? Yeah, so anyone who listened to the preview show or the pre- preview and prediction show uh, last week will know that I actually predicted a draw in this game, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. And Yes, you did. And I think, and I kind of going into the game thought you know Union have looked very jaded recently they look very tired on their feet and you know Wolfsburg have kind of improved and Mm. you know I think that's kind of largely how it went to be perfectly honest with you Um, it was a game in which Wolfsburg spent much of the game taking taking the game so I keep using the word game there uh, taking the game to Union Berlin and it just felt like a very tired and clumsy performance from Union, you know. I think mm. I kind of watched the game thinking, you know, this kind of system and these defensive tactics that Urs Fischer's kind of implemented at Union have worked so well for them um, in the sense that it kind of negates the need for gagging pressing and it means that they can almost kind of pick teams off, teams with technically better players than them. Um, and that's not just the likes of Bayern or Dortmund, but it's you know basically just every other team in the top six, seven, eight of the Bundesliga. And you can still make that case, I think, now, um, man for man. Wolfsburg certainly have a better team for, than Union Berlin, for example. Mm-hmm. But when you kind of get to a point where, you know, you're fighting on so many fronts and, you know, obviously Union have done so, so well in, the, in Europa League this season that it certainly felt as though things were beginning to kind of come apart in the, the seams, you know, and I think that kind of style of football and that defensive kind of tactic only really works if you have 11 players on the pitch who are fully fit mentally and physically uh, and are capable of kind of putting the extra effort in. And this was a match in which Wolfsburg routinely just kind of picked the ball off Union and attacked. And I'm not saying it's really a one-sided game because it wasn't really a one-sided game, but it was a match in which Wolfsburg thought, we're at home, we're on the ascendancy, we're going to try and win this match. And Mm. to be perfectly honest with you, um, I thought Union were very lucky to get the penalty that they did get. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, it it technically was um, a foul in the sense... Um, you know, it was a uh, you know Gulavogi stepped on um, you know his opponent's foot technically, but it was kind of off the ball. The fit, the move had kind of already finished. I thought it was a very harsh call for the referee. Perfectly honest with you, but okay, fine, whatever. Uh, I'm not here to argue that. And you know, Juranovic obviously scores a very good penalty from it, but I feel like that kind of moment of shall we say, you know, stupidity from Wolfsburg really kind of rescued Union in the end because I felt like this was a match in which Wolfsburg probably should have won by two or three goals. They certainly hit the post. They had chances. Uh, Wimmer came on and actually scored a very kind of neat, composed goal, um, which, again, every time I watch Wolfsburg, I'm always very surprised with Wimmer, so I don't understand why Kovac kind of keeps pulling him in and out of the team. But anyway, Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess, I mean, I... I, (laughs) 
I don't really want to say, you know, Uni on a running out of steam because I feel like there's a lot of people who are just kind of desperate to say that about them. Um, yeah. And, you know, there's still a lot of football left to be played, so they might be able to turn things around, but it felt to me as though they they looked tired here. They looked kind of out of ideas. And it's it, I guess it is a bit of a worry now for them in the sense that they obviously, you know, we're still some way off the end of the season here. And they've probably still got quite a, diff- a lot of difficult games to play. Mm, I think like a lot of teams, they're probably really looking forward to that international break. Um, I know you and I do because <laughs> we're going to take a break too. But <laughs> I think they are really looking forward to it as well. Um, I think there's a few teams that have categorized into that. Union is one. Uh, Dortmund is, I think, another that will be quite happy about this international break, Stefan. Um, I think the one team that's going to probably hate it is Bayern because they probably will have to send a lot of players to it. And also, um, it's just not convenient for them, right? But it's interesting that this break is coming up. You essentially just have to get through next week somehow. Some teams have to play Champions League, right? Mm. Um, Union Berlin will be in the Europa League, of course, where they're carrying a a draw into the second leg. Um, But I think they are, I would categorize them as a team that is looking forward to 10 days off. Mm. I think, I think the real obvious comparison here is Frankfurt last season, you know, Mm -hmm. in the sense that they knew that they didn't have the squad to basically play in two competitions. They put all their eggs in one basket with the Europa League and they made history by, you know, obviously winning the Europa League. So fair play to them. Um, I don't really think Union have the talent to go all the way in that regard. I don't really think yeah. they expect to, but it's almost as if they maybe have to kind of make that decision to kind of draw a line under the Europa League campaign and say, well, if we really want to stay in the top six this season or finish in the top six, then maybe we kind of have to... I don't want to say throw the towel in the, in the Europa League because that's such a horrible thing to say, but... And they obviously won't because, you know, this is this in itself is a history-defining season and the fans will be just adoring the fact that they're playing European competition. So I really wouldn't suggest that for a moment, but it's a double-edged sword. And I think, you know, they are just a victim of their own success at the end of the day. I think it's so tricky, right? Because we are, the, we, including this show, um, have been so demanding that Bundesliga teams do better in European competitions. And I think... Um, the Champions League is obviously like the cherry on top, but I think if the league really wants to improve as a whole, it's it's winning the Europa League. Mm-hmm. Like having teams in the final stages of the Europa League every year is, I think, where where this league really can facilitate some growth, right? Because if you have teams winning the Europa League, especially if it's like someone like Frankfurt or New Berlin, would maybe not finish in the top four, you have that extra team in the Champions League, which gives the league extra attention. Um, so I don't want to suggest any team to drop out of the Europa League. But I think in Union Berlin's case, how far could they really go, right? Mm. I think that is, that's a very fair question. I mean, we Frankfurt had a couple runs before they won the entire thing. Um, I look, for example, at someone like Leverkusen. And I would say, if, if I was Leverkusen, I'd be, okay, we're not going to finish top four. So let's just put our all our eggs in the Europa League basket. Because if we win this thing, A, that's great for the club, right? Mm. And B, we qualify for the Champions League. And they have the talent to do so, right? Um, so it's, yeah, it's an interesting one. It is, I think that some clubs have to make that kind of decision. And there is Bundesliga teams that are obviously in a position where they could win the whole thing. And it is some who will say, well, this is maybe a step too far. Um yeah, and then Union Berlin, it's it's going to be. I mean, they have that return game against Union Saint Gilloy from Belgium, right? Mm-hmm. Upstart from Belgium, um, which I think is going to be very interesting. But yeah, I, I'm kind of with you. Um, I think at some point, the club will have to make a subconscious decision on what's more important. And it's really interesting too. I think that coaches and players will never, ever, voluntarily drop out of one competition or another. Like these decisions are never made on a conscious level, right? Mm. Because like, obviously these are all consummated professionals. They want to win every game that they're in. But I think that at some point there comes like somewhere in the back of the mind, or maybe it's decisions that are made further up where you just like, 
players are being put on the field in in a rotation basis that sort of priority prioritize one 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 competition over another if that mm. makes sense yeah and at the end of the day you know while we as Bundesliga fans are all hoping that Union can kind of mount a <laughs> serious title challenge everyone at the club would say you know that's not we did we never said we were going to do that that's something that was thrust upon <laughs> us because we did well so yeah. don't blame us when we start kind of reverting back to the mean and it's a perfectly logical thing to say you know so yeah by no means is a as a draw against Wolfsburg a disaster and by no means is kind of dropping out of the top four, the top four a disaster either for Union you know uh, their fans are having a time of their life and long may it continue I'd say so yeah, that's not mm. that's not that's not end the podcast in a dour note. It's a very it's, they're having a very impressive season. I hope they continue to be on the Europa League, and you know, even if they do kind of just spend the rest of the season fighting for a top six spot, they'll still be well and beyond the expectations that were put on the club at the start of the season. Yeah, and I want to point out too that a break has usually done the club quite well, right? Mm. So we'll see how they recover from the international break. Uh, Stefan, the international break. I um, want to bring this up because you and I had a chat before this podcast. So, scheduling note. This week, all everything is going to be normal. Um, you're going to get your main show, your two shows behind the paywall, and of course, the previous show. Next week, uh, we're going to do things a little bit different. I want to give people lots of warnings so that they, they can't say anything to us. <laughs> <laughs> Next week, it will be a bit different. We're just going to, you're going to get this show, the main show. And then Stefan and I will go on a much deserved break. <laughs> 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 because that's what the world of football is doing. Yes, there's international games on. Um, it's really difficult, A, to schedule podcasts around that. And B, it's also just, a time where the two of us want to focus on a little bit of us time, but also a little bit of writing time too, right? So, hmm. um, yeah, not not so not, us, week, not us together, us separately, no, not us together <laughs> separately, which is also important. I don't want to start spreading <laughs> speculation. No, 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 separately. <laughs> so um, we start <laughs> because we do actually have real sp- spouses and partners that also want to see us. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, then next week you're just gonna get the main show. Um, want to just point that out. You're still gonna get the written content on the side. So um, that newsletter from Stefan, newsletter from me, and then the week after we're going to come back with the um, with one of the uh, behind the paywall shows, and then of course the preview. Um, you know, sort of maybe look at Germany, what they have done during the international break and all that. But just a scheduling note so that everyone is aware. I'm going to shout it out a few more times in the next few weeks, the next few episodes as well, Stefan, so that everyone is aware. Um, next week is going to be a bit different. Anyhow, as always, this show is brought to you by Bet Online. Stefan, any final thoughts before we wrap this up? Yes, just to say that we've been nominated for an award. Oh, yeah. Uh, we have been nominated for an award. So we've been nominated for the Sports <laughs> Podcast Awards Best Soccer Podcast. Um, if you do sign up to the, the newsletter, either as a paid or a free subscriber, you should have got an email through the weekend about this. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone who has already signed up and voted for us. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll leave a link uh, and a descript- kind of um, you know, instructions and a link in the description of this podcast so if you're listening on your phone on spotify or apple Podcasts, whatever uh google play you can kind of check your check the descriptions of the podcast and you should be able to kind of jump in there and vote if you'd like of course if you do like the show then feel free um but yeah it's one of those things where you know you have to sign up and vote uh for your favorite podcast and we'd appreciate it if you could so yeah if you've got a couple of minutes it doesn't take too long um yeah, and that'd be appreciated. So yeah, and uh, so yeah, if it's um, if you listen to this on Substack uh, or through the paid uh, option, then you can just find it on the Substack page. But if you listen to it through a normal podcasting app, it should be in the descriptions of this episode. Mm. Yeah, it's an illustrious list. So even being just nominated is a huge honor. Yeah. Um. And yeah, thank you to everyone who's voted. So on that note. Thanks again for listening and we'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, auf Wiedersehen.
Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform is making it easier than ever to support Black-owned brands. When you go to walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited, you'll not only get to shop products from Black-owned brands, but also learn about founders like Janelle Stevens of Camille Rose, which specializes in products for naturally curly hair. And there are many more awesome products that you have yet to discover. It's all easy to find with Walmart's Black and Unlimited platform. Join in on celebrating Black brands today and every day at Walmart. We are Black and Unlimited. Visit walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited to discover more. That's walmart.com slash Black and Unlimited.